breaking the wall of computer stupidity. How wavelet analysis improves geophysics, biology, and art history. Ingrid Dovichy, Duke University. When the wall fell, I was at Bell Laboratories in the state of New Jersey. I remember a general sense of incredulity. Okay, computer stupidity. So, are computers stupid? Well, maybe. So, these are things that have happened to me, one thing. So, you know, regularly you have to log in places. So, you type your name, you type your password, you have to take something that you will remember, but it has all these rules to obey, so I found this wonderful password. And then it tells you, this is not the password for your records. Try again. Okay, you try again. And then it says, a temporary password has been mailed to your account, because you were no good. Okay, you go to your email account, you get it, it says, waarom so doen? Okay, you try it, you type it, dot, and so on, and then it says, okay, you must change your password now. Your new password must have at least eight characters, it must have a lowercase and uppercase letters, it must have a number, it must have some non-alphanumeric, it cannot contain a word in the dictionary. Fine. So you say, well, the previous one had all that, and it didn't like it, it didn't know it, so let's try it again. You confirm, and it says, this password is unacceptable. <laughs> it, that was your previous password. This happened to me, not for this conference, but I mean, it's really, then you say, oh my God. And then, I mean, this didn't happen, but it made me think of it. I mean, you remember Clippy? I mean, okay. So, it was been a long day and I provided some light relief. But computers also have really enabled many things. Uh, nice gadgets. I mean, uh, well, we all know them. But not only that, I mean, these gadgets typically are now made on the other side of the world, and the shipping to get them to us, and that is quite cheap these days, uh, is something that needs a lot of computing, because they arrive in these big containers that then have to be uh, dealt with and so on, and this is what a container port looks like. You see how many there are? to keep track of all that without very powerful computer programs, of which actually Berlin is one of the world experts, uh, uh, would not be possible. Airfoil design. So this is how the White Brothers did it. Earlier this year, I was at the Ben Franklin Museum, and they actually showed me the things that the Wright brothers, I actually had no idea that they had done experiments, but they had these tiny little airfoils that they, of different shapes on which they did little experiments with a fan and so on and measuring how much it pulled or not. And that's how they decided on, on the, the shape of the airfoil. Now, wind tunnel experiments these days are much, much larger. But these winglets, these very uh, particular shapes of wings where the, the, the tips uh, uh, go up, these were not designed with wind tunnel experiments. I'm not sure that with just wind tunnel experiments we would ever have gotten there. They were designed via scientific computation. Okay, lots of computing, also very nifty mathematics and all that. And I'd like to uh, uh, show you a couple of case studies in which I'm involved these days, which involve using computers and actually bringing it to scientists in some cases who are quite used to computers, but as we uh, go on to, to people who are less and less connected to the computer, but who, for whom we make, make things possible. Okay, global tomography. Um, you can find on the web a record of all the large earthquakes of, in this case, uh, the last, last f four or five years, where uh, the, uh, 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 the color gives you uh, uh, the, the, the age with respect to the day on which you look it up, and the uh, uh, dimension of the circle, the magnitude of the earthquake. All these earthquakes, are, and, and of course the center is where the earthquake took place. All these earthquakes are measured by many places, many seismic uh, uh, stations around the world, 
and you can look all the, up all those seismograms. And in fact, uh, with these, these very large earthquakes, I mean, you can see that they uh, uh, can originate far away and you can feel them on the other side of the Earth. Because uh, the Earth is layered with many uh, uh, more or less spherically symmetric layers, these rays this is act are actually bent through the Earth. And so you get information on places quite deep in the mantle by looking at these space programs. And typically what's happened is that we can compute very well when the time of arrival would be if the Earth was completely spherically symmetric, but it's not quite. And because it's not quite, the time of arrival is a little changed. And from that information, we can actually compute uh, uh, properties in the mantle that are very localized. Hot plumes, bigger hot upwellings, like under, under southern Africa. And uh, OK, now how do you analyze? I mean, you analyze typically when you talk to f about functions on the sphere, you use spherical harmonics. I mean, mathematicians and physicists are, uh, are know them very well, and, and, and geophysicists, and, uh, and love them a lot. And they are very good for things that live on the whole sphere and that have a certain pattern. So a function that looked like that, where blue is negative and uh, 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 reddish is positive, on the Earth, on an Earth map and Mercator projection, would be very easy to express in spherical harmonics. But we are now talking about things that are very localized. And so what uh, we are doing is we are building special uh, uh, wavelet type things that make that computation that are much more uh, 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 tailored to short, uh, to very localized uh, 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 functions and that help us analyze and do global tomography like this. And it's ongoing to be continued. Another case study, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, we use similar localization techniques to improve our reading of functional magnetic resonance imaging that are used by neuroscientists to understand brain function. You've all seen this in scientific uh, 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 papers where, where they show you a brain that lights up in some spaces when they were, people were asked to perform a certain task. Okay, first of all, brains, these are two human brains, and uh, all brains look uh, they're folded. I mean, if you took the surface of a human cortex, you would get uh, an area that is uh, about half a meter by half a meter, so uh, a quarter uh, meter squared. And uh, all that is folded up in, into just that one little skull. And uh, uh, the folds are different for everybody. Look, I have followed here on these two brains one particular folding, and you see it's very different. Uh, typically what's done if people do experiments for certain tasks and seeing how people uh, 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 register them is they uh, take the data and they already kind of, it, it, imagine the, the balloon all folded like that and they blow it up, they inflate it in order to get all these wrinkles out because the wrinkles are different for everybody. But of course by doing that you distort the data. And so we have developed, and we, uh, 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 this is also ongoing, uh, special wavelets that, are, that use uh, uh, a view of the cortex for each individual uh, 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 subject and build wavelets that manage to localize on there in order to get to a much more accurate reading of the fMRI experiments. And here are, in fact, uh, uh, is on the left, you have what would be done with a conventional analysis. And on the right, the same data, but because we have these much better localized data, we are able to capture much more precisely what the connection is, what, what the activation is. And again, it's to be continued. Uh, next, what we will do is we'll look at function for different uh, subjects in order to do registration rather than using the geometry, which is not perfect since brains do look so different for different people in order to understand imaging better, to be continued. Anatomical surfaces. So we are now, I mean, Many surfaces we, you've, you've, you've seen in applications, people, you can get something scanned, you can even get your body scanned and then send it to a catalog so that they will get you clothes exactly to your measure. I mean, that's not really science, but. Um, so 
objects can be scanned, they can be scanned in different ways, and what you typically acquire is a cloud of points. From that cloud of points we can go to a mesh, a triangulated mesh for the surface, fine. But, so now we have a table of numbers representing the surface. But if you do that two times with the same thing, you get two different lists of numbers. How do you recognize it's the same surface? Or if it's not the same surface, but they're very similar, how do you recognize that they're so similar? Or if they are two things that are inspired by the same thing, I mean, here you have a real beetle and a dinky toy beetle. And the dinky toy beetle actually is different in proportion from the real beetle because it didn't look right. It's shorter. I mean, it's more squashed. Otherwise, uh, I mean, a real beetle is really longer than the dinky toy proportions. But how would you quantify that? I mean, that kind of difference from these point clouds. So we develop mathematics that use both local and global properties in order to, uh, 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 to, to capture that similarity, to capture distance between surfaces. Um, let me give you an example of where we apply this to biology. So uh, people who work on the phenotypes, not the genotype, but the phenotypes of, of, of animals. Uh, in this case, we're looking at different uh, bones in, 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 uh, in mammals. I mean, we have molars, and we have a, a piece of radius, and we have a metatarsal. And I think the radius and the metatarsal have been, been switched, actually. But so they, uh, they study these, and they learn very carefully how they develop, and they, put, they learn how to put landmarks on them, which are uh, visualized here with these little colored dots. And then they look at these landmarks and how the landmarks change from one, uh, 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 from one uh, uh, sample to another. Uh, it takes a lot of training to do this, and then it takes a lot of drudgery in order to really put those points on and then make that comparison. Um, the problem is that it's really not only the local landmarks, but the whole global organization of them that uh, decides that, that guides the, 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 the biologist in putting those landmarks. So you need a lot of training to do this, and it's not very reproducible. And so uh, geneticists don't trust this. I mean, they say the, phen the phenotype people are very frustrated by this. Uh, what we have done is we we've developed methods that make it possible for us to compare when we have two samples, the whole global geometry, and that make possible for us to define mappings from one to the other, which we can then, in order if we want to test it, use it, and this shows how, given such a mapping, we would take the landmarks put on by the biologist on one, transport them to the other, and you see, we end up some, with something very similar to what they do. Of course, it's not our goal to transport landmarks. We want to get to a method where the landmarks wouldn't even be needed. Uh, this is a paper that was just published, and it's, it's uh, uh, biologists are being very, I mean, some biologists are very excited by it. Finally, to be continued, finally, here, I'm moving the furthest away from people who uh, are used to uh, working with computers and programming computers, art historians. This is a case study in which we were given uh, uh, a lot of uh, paintings by Hulsen van der Weyden, who was uh, the grandson of the much more famous Hogier van der Weyden, who was an early 16th century work, uh, a painter and who had a large workplace in which he had an unusual number of apprentices. Um, as was usual in that time, uh, there were underdrawings under the paintings. And he used different styles of underpaint, of underdrawings. And people thought, well, maybe this was because of an evolution through his career. And then they found that paintings in the same period might have those different styles. So let me show you underpaintings. So here are four samples. On the left, class one, you see little parallel lines indicating shading, like a woodcut. Uh, you see them mostly where they were indicating something that wasn't uh, present, like shading in exactly that form in the painting, or when the, the, when, when the, the painter changed his opinion in, in making it, so when a mistake is, is corrected. So on the second class one, you see that the nose and the mouth were placed in different places. You see the underdrawing, and so you also see on the throat these little parallel lines that uh, uh, indicate volume. 
In class three, you see that there's a whole lot of lines that indicate a sketch of what the face should be. And then class four is not even a sketch. I mean, I would say this is just a very coarse indication of there's a nose here and some eyes there. I mean, and so these are the different classes of, of things we were looking at. Uh, the, the question was, if, you, if I give you the painted surface, can you distinguish from the painted surface what the style of underdrawing was? The idea being that maybe the style of underdrawing was telling you whether it was the master himself that was going to finish it or one of the apprentices. And so we were given blind, uh, blind data sets. And indeed, we learned, I mean, and I'm sweeping a whole lot of mathematics under the rug here, we learned to distinguish them and that we found that of the seven images in our blind data set that were by Hulsen van der Weyden, we got it right for six. And the seventh we were completely wrong with, completely. And we said, I mean, how is this possible? <clears throat> I heard. Uh, and we looked at it, and we, and we said it was class three, and they had told us class one. And then we looked at it and we said, but look, I mean, this is not class three. This is not parallel lines. This is a sketch. We had it right. They had mislabeled it. So we are very enthusiastic, and this is to be continued. And here I'm stopping. Thank you.